working to ensure better mental health for all, psychiatrists are gathering at San Francisco's Moscone Center to connect with colleagues, learn best practices, and hear all about the latest research. With new scope for interventions and better understanding of systems affecting mental health, insight into mind and body is a key part of psychiatry today. And to get to the bottom of it, we're here at the 2023 annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association, and this is APA TV. Welcome back to our second show, direct from San Francisco, where psychiatrists from across the globe are gathering for another great day at the annual meeting of the APA. We'll take you through all the very latest developments and biggest topics in psychiatry today. Our theme for this episode, mind and body. Let's see what's to come. On the show today, we look at perinatal mental health and get some insights into healthy brain aging. Plus more from the APA TV film series as we continue to explore some of the exciting work being done in psychiatry around the world. And remember, you can watch APA TV on screens at the Moscone, in select hotels, on the APA website, via the app, and of course on the virtual platform. And you can find, share, subscribe and like on social media. First up, let's find out from Dr. Eric Williams what to watch out for today right here at the annual meeting. Hello, I'm Dr. Eric Williams, Chair of the Scientific Program Committee. Welcome to day three of APA's annual meeting. This morning at 1030 in Exhibit Hall F, we're pleased to welcome award-winning author Heather McGee to the main stage for our plenary entitled Emerging Voices, DEIB, Leadership and Innovation. After her speech, she'll join in a panel with APA President Dr. Rebecca Brindell, American Medical Association President Dr. Jack Resnick, and American Bar Association President Deborah Enix Ross. They will discuss the role and responsibility of our professions in advancing diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in America. Between scientific sessions, you'll want to check out the Psychiatry Innovation Lab from 2 to 4, where we'll have a pitch competition for new and great ideas in mental health. That's at the Mental Health Innovation Zone in Hall B Foyer of Moscone South. Then at 5.30 tonight in Exhibit Hall F, come celebrate your colleagues at our Convocation of Distinguished Fellows. After the traditional ceremony, we'll host an important conversation on the opioid epidemic with award-winning author Beth Macy and Dr. Stephen Lloyd, moderated by former AMA president and psychiatrist, Dr. Patrice Harris. Enjoy your day. Now, to a center who know that mental health care is key to health care in general, Let's take a look at the Metro Health System's Behavioral Health Center. The path in relation to behavioral health began in the 1990s when Dr. Terry Stanson joined Metro Health. And it was a path that was associated with innovation in relation to behavioral health care and really addressing the acute needs, the early needs in relation to stress and trauma and pediatric populations. I believe Metro Health does treat the whole person and focuses on patient-centered care. So whatever the specific needs of that person is, is what we try to meet. The future of Metro Health is really centered around uh, ensuring access to services uh, within uh, people's communities, where they want to be seen, how they want to be seen. It's intended to be patient-centered uh, with a population health focus so that we know where the resources are needed and so that we can support them. We all hope to keep our brains active as we grow older. To find out how though, we stop by the group with all the answers from mindfulness to better sleep. Take a look to find out the key to healthy brain aging. Healthy and brain aging implies as you get older that you are maintaining mental acuity and well-being into old age. 
The World Health Organization says that um, there's over 55 million people who have Alzheimer's or some sort of a major neurocognitive disorder, dementia. So anything that we can do to promote healthy brain and aging is really, really important. To achieve healthy aging, there are a number of different components. And some of the ones that are especially important are um, appropriate exercise, appropriate diet and nutrition, proper sleep, and mindfulness. We can show why exercise is beneficial. You see changes, structural changes in the brain. You see changes in molecules such as BDNF and inflammatory markers that help prevent this cognitive decline that we see with aging. Whereas with cognitive exercises, you don't see the same kind of mechanistic data available. However, cognitive activities such as learning a new language or staying connected with your friends and family or learning a new task such as a musical instrument, they all have shown to help prevent cognitive decline. So there's no perfect prescription, but any activity is good. It could be hiking, running, swimming. So do it regularly and stay connected. That's the best advice that we can give right now. Sleep affects mental health uh, at every age. Um, we need sleep to function on a daily basis in our lives emotionally and, and cognitively. If you're not sleeping well at night, I think the first thing I recommend to all my patients is to sort of assess your environment and figure out is your environment conducive to sleep? Um, is the temperature right? Is the lighting dim enough? You know, are you being distracted by electronics? Also looking at some of your medications. Could any of your medications be keeping you up at night? but there are definitely many things that we can do to improve our sleep that don't require prescriptions. Diet over the years makes a difference in brain health, cognitive health, and also emotional health as well. In general, we know that there are certain diets that are bad for the heart because the heart is an in organ. It receives nutrients and oxygen. So any diets that, that lack problems and cause problems for the heart will also be problems for the brain as well. Our Western diets with its heavy emphasis on pizzas or burgers and fries, high salty foods or high fat foods or sugar drinks, these things actually cause problems in the long term for the supporting the organ like the heart or the brain itself. However, there are some things that are good for the brain. In fact, it's been found that the Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet are heart healthy diets. And similarly, those diets are also good for the brain as well. Mindfulness can be helpful to people of all ages, um, but in older adults, it's especially helpful with reducing stress, anxiety, depression, and helping to manage pain. You can do things like, you know, meditative breathing, mindfulness-based nutrition, um, body scan. Those are different kinds of techniques that mindfulness practitioners will engage patients or clients in. And when you're choosing somebody to help you clinically, it would be important to have a practitioner who also practices mindfulness. It can be very, very useful and helpful. Let's take a look at another group doing great work in psychiatry. It's Texas A&M University School of Medicine. As Texas A&M University was developing the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, they successfully recruited Dr. Israel Librazon as a professor in the department as well as the founder head of the department. Within this concept of growing our clinical care, we see ourselves as a leaders in providing the most advanced evidence-based care in Texas, in the United States, but also anywhere else in the world. We uh, felt moral obligation to extend a helping hand to Ukrainian people. The main goal of the project is to uh, provide evidence-based care to Ukrainian people traumatized by war. The department continues to enhance the development of innovative training programs, research collaborations, and the expansion of clinical services to support the department's mission of patient care, education, and research. We know food affects our physical health, but its role in mental health and the impact we can have on it is little understood. Talk us through the field of nutritional psychiatry and the ways that mental health of the nation can be improved through good eating 
I'm joined by Dr. Bhagwan Baru. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for bringing me in here and talking about it. So tell us a little bit about what nutritional psychiatry is. So nutritional psychiatry is a new field, a developing one. And it's kind of a discipline that tells us, informs us, what adequate nutrition in a person can do for his or her mental health and what malnutrition can do the harm. As such, we would like people to know about it. Tell us a little bit about what those effects can be. Uh, good nutrition goes into the system and affects the microbiome in the gut, which in turn affects the brain, the psychology, the endocrine system and the immunological system all on one axis, ending up producing good results for the mind in terms of their moods, cognition, behaviors, thoughts, perceptions. What sort of, when we talk about a good diet, what, what do we mean by a good diet? Okay, diets vary around the world, as we all know. However, a good diet pattern should have certain basic components, certain requirements that are necessary for a human being to continue in a healthy manner. These could be carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins and minerals. And let's not forget hydration. Water is equally important. Do you think this is a field of psychiatry that's adequately understood? I wish that were true. I am sorry to state that from what I have seen, psychiatrists, even if they know the understanding of the matter, are either unable to inform their patients, and if they do, those patients may not be sold on the idea and may not be following it. It's an interesting concept because I think, you know, we're told a lot about the importance of uh, good nutrition for our, for, our, for our general health, but we don't necessarily associate that with, uh, with psychiatrists. What do you think the role in this is of the psychiatrist? A psychiatrist can play a very important role in the field. They have a good influence and a good rapport with people they provide treatment for. One thing that I would advocate very strongly is when a treatment plan is individually created for a patient, that the attention should not be on medications and therapies, but also other fields, and one of them, according to me, should be nutrition. If the patient leaves the clinic without basic information about what is healthy for them to eat and what is not, then I think a full service is not being done. So what needs to be done now? Everybody who is in the field of treatment should be informed that these are the basic nutritional facts that they should be able to impart to their patients and make sure that it is done in a language that is easily assimilable and can be incorporated in their daily kitchens. Well, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. It's a fascinating subject, so thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Next up, let's go to the Autism Centre at the Child Mind Institute. Children with autism are very different from one another, and being able to understand as early as possible who needs uh, uh, support, what type of support they need, and when is critical to transform the life of, uh, of children. The Autism Center at the Child Mind Institute is a hub where clinicians and scientists meet together to try to understand what are the needs of each individual with autism, each child and their parents, by providing the best evidence-based intervention and improving knowledge, increasing knowledge, uh, uh, investing in science. The Autism Center at the Child Mind Institute has comprehensive evaluation services where we provide gold standard evaluations for children who either have or are suspected of having autism or other related neurodevelopmental disorders. And we have evidence-based treatment services that start as young as, with children as young as toddlers, all the way up through young adults. Now to Stanford, where the Suicide Research Prevention Laboratory's research is at the forefront of innovative suicide prevention strategies. 
Suicide continues to account for approximately one life lost every 40 seconds. Our program utilizes cognitive, biological, and behavioral testing paradigms with an emphasis on translational therapeutics for suicide prevention across the lifespan. We've been fortunate to work with partners such as NIH, DOD, the White House, and others to guide national suicide prevention initiatives. Our mission is to identify novel therapeutic targets for suicide prevention, including early efforts to establish sleep and suicide prevention as a unique subfield within suicidology. Suicide rates have remained alarmingly intractable over time and in some cases have even increased. This motivated development of our NIH and DOD funded suicide prevention clinical trials testing efficacy of a non-pharmacological insomnia treatment among high-risk civilians and military veterans. Everything essentially improved. I know that together we can change the landscape of suicide prevention in our lifetime. Even one suicide is too many if that person is our loved one. The perinatal period can be one of the most joyous but also most stressful experiences people go through in their lives. At the same time, psychiatric treatment is extremely low in this population, with many issues going uncared for. To talk us through this issue, I'm joined by Dr. Diana Clark and Jonathan Albert. Okay, we're excited to be here. Uh, let's, let's start off. How does pregnancy or how can uh, pregnancy affect mental health? So pre pregnancy um, creates a number of stressors in people's lives. It's both a very happy time uh, but also a time um, when somebody needs increased psychosocial supports, and often people don't have those supports. It's also a time of significant biological change. So yep. many of the endocrine changes and hormonal changes during pregnancy predispose toward mental health problems, particularly if somebody has a history of mental health issues in the past or substance use uh, disorder problems. So it's a time of both elevated happiness and a time of elevated risk for mental health and substance use problems. And how common is that? How, how often do those you know, issues a a appear? It's quite common. Um, it's you know, mental health problems and substance use problems are highly prevalent in the general population. There seems to be an elevated rate of both mental illness and substance use um, during the time of pregnancy and shortly postpartum. And I know you've, you've conducted a study into this, haven't you? Tell us a little bit about the study. So the study came about with um, pregnant persons reporting anecdotally that when they do, if they have mental and substance use disorder, disorder issues and they want to become pregnant or they do become pregnant, that they're being dropped by their behavioral health providers. And um, part of the issue that came up and the CDC Foundation had this um, request for proposal to kind of address this issue. Is this real? And so... Um, the project came about where we really wanted to understand this issue. Is it real? And we really wanted to understand it not just from the pregnant person's perspective. We wanted to understand it from the behavioral health provider's perspective. And when I talk about behavioral health providers, I'm talking about psychiatrists, psychologists, nurse practitioners, counselors, social workers. And so we wanted to understand it from all of those perspectives using a different kind of um, methods. So we wanted to do focus groups where we hear the issue from these different groups, and then also collecting from survey data to kind of understand the issue quantitatively. Does this make sense? So that's what we've actually done. And the project itself has been guided by a panel of experts, um, including um, researchers who, and clinicians who focuses on perinatal mental health. And Dr. Alpert is the chair for that um, advisory panel that we do have. And what did you find? So some of the issues that we do find, we do hear pregnant persons saying, yes, when I do have uh, mental health issues, sometimes my uh, provider focuses on the obstetric care and doesn't necessarily pay attention to the symptoms that I'm reporting. And some people have actually talked about when I go in and I'm pregnant, if I'm on a medication, sometimes my provider will stop that medication and nothing is done thereafter. And so I have to struggle with these symptoms. And so um, we found that in our um, um, focus group material, some just the information that we got from interviews, but we also found it in the survey data. Did you find that women in, in, uh, through pregnancy got psychiatric support they needed? There's a lot of variability among providers and this level of comfort, and that yeah. was something that came across in yeah. focus groups. 
some some people have had training. They feel pretty confident about their ability to continue treating people who they've treated before who are now pregnant, um, or to accept new patients who are pregnant or postpartum. Um, other providers don't feel that they've had access to the training that they would need to feel comfortable um, and don't have people in their area, particularly in rural areas yeah. of the country, uh, don't have access to people they can refer to who have the expertise that's needed. And so those people who are pregnant um, or postpartum who are treated by people who don't feel comfortable fall through the cracks because yeah. they really don't have anybody in their circle who has the expertise that's needed. So I know you're doing a session here at the uh, at the conference. What's your message going to be to delegates here? Perinatal mental health care really matters. It matters for the birthing person, the person carrying the child, and it also matters for the child, the fetus. And so um, it is important for um, these perinatal mental health issues to be taken care of. And that the fact that we do have gaps in care, we have gaps in training, and as an organization, that um, trained psychiatrists or info, um, a professional organization, it is really important for APA to be at the forefront and kind of kind of guide in some of those um, training needs that are necessary. Thank you both so much indeed for joining us. Really interesting. I hope the session goes well and thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Lots of work to do there to better reach people in the perinatal period. Now to a centre already providing state-of-the-art maternal mental health services right here in the Bay Area. El Camino Health started its perinatal journey in 2008 with the launch of the MOMS program. After that, we realised that mothers needed highly specialised care in an acute psychiatry setting. We did a pilot in collaboration with other perinatal units and after a great deal of work and collaboration, we launched our own perinatal unit in 2020. It is one of its kind in the country with the most robust treatment planning to address both the mother's needs as well as the needs of the baby. In addition, we have probably the most robust discharge planning anywhere in the United States. Mental health treatment takes a village, and I think it requires us to understand the whole individual who they are as a person and what they need to thrive. I think it requires the support of the therapist, the psychiatrist, as well as the family. I think it really requires involvement of a whole team to help somebody move through their mental health journey. Well, first of all, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So I know a lot of folks here will know, but for those who don't, tell us a little bit about the work of the foundation. So my name is Raul Andrews. I am the executive director. Uh, our mission is very straightforward. Uh, we are trying to advance the mental health and well-being of individuals and communities where they live, learn, work, worship, and play. So tell us a little bit about some of the campaigns you're running. So uh, our framework is called Notice Talk Act. Uh, or NTA, and the NTA framework really is all about noticing when somebody's behavior is out of the ordinary or off the spectrum. Once you've noticed somebody in crisis, then the question is, how do we have courageous conversations using bridge words so you know how to talk more effectively to get some information that can be helpful? And then when we get to act under the Notice Talk Act framework, really what we're trying to do is make sure that we're not just saying there's a one-stop, one-size-fits-all. There could be a range of things that might help a person or a family in crisis. you got to have that tool built equipped so that you're able to do it. So we've heard a lot at the conference about the Mental Health Care Works campaign. Now, I know you're heavily involved in, in, in that. Tell us a little bit about that campaign. So the Mental Health Care Works campaign is an umbrella mental health literacy campaign that is designed to change the narrative on awareness, on attitude and behavior. And so what happens, what we expect to see is that people are gonna learn their mental health conditions are indeed treatable. And we just wanna talk about treatability. And then you get to the point in the middle of the campaign where you're saying, now that you know it's treatable, why don't we talk to a medical provider about it? And then once we've done that, we hope we're gonna transform like others in diabetes, cancer, 
uh, HIV and AIDS, where they don't talk about stigma. They talk about no hell without mental health. So we're coming out of COVID now, uh, you know, hopefully out of uh, COVID now. What difference has that made to your work? So I believe it is hurt and helped at the same time, because the reality of it is everybody has been changed by what we ex had to deal with for the last three years. Nobody's coming out of it the same, and the needs for all of us is different. So whereas before the pandemic, people might not have been comfortable at any stage, at any age, talking about their mental health challenges, now they are. But the numbers are really scary. Right. Depression, anxiety, PTSD, eating disorders, off the spectrum. So uh, we've had to redouble our efforts. We're growing our team a little bit. But ultimately, we believe this mental health care works campaign is going to really help us stem the time. Perfect. Thank you ever so much. Really enjoyed talking to you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Keep a look out for the Mental Health Care Works campaign and make sure to get involved. Off to Germany now, where the Berlin Mental Health Institute is providing comprehensive modern treatment for all its patients. The MHI is a modern treatment facility for patients with different psychiatric disorders. We provide patient-centered individualized treatment in the scope to get rid of the disorder and to foster personal growth. You and me look carefully that only treatment options are included in our treatment package, which have a really solid research background. We have a wide range of different therapies and treatments, such as psychoeducation, um, body psychotherapy, art therapy and once a week our cooking group. Because we are such a small facility it's fairly easy for us to have the flexibility to always adjust the treatment plans to implement new approaches and putting the patient in the center of the treatment process. Great work there in Berlin. Now that's all we've got for you today as the sun sets on the Golden Gate Bridge, but we're just halfway through the 2023 APA TV series and there's lots more to come. Tomorrow, we speak to this year's president, Rebecca Brandel, and discuss using AI to prevent suicide as we focus on technology and psychiatry. And remember, you can watch APA TV on screens at the Moscone, in select hotels, on the APA website, via the app, and a course on the virtual platform. And you can find, share, subscribe, and like on social media. Thanks for watching. Make sure to be back tomorrow, and we'll see you then.